Lo asak ben dere Torah. Please, Jehovah, make the Torah's words sweet in my mouth, in the mouth of all your people, the house of Israel. May we, your children, all of Israel, know your name in the name of your Messiah, Yeshua. And may we study your Torah simply because it is good. Blessed are you, Jehovah, who gave us the Torah of truth. Amen. You may be seated as the Lord brings forgiveness to you <coughs> for attacking the pastor. Hallelujah. <laughs> you may come to the tables if you desire. We are going over one verse. Next week, we'll go over the last two verses, and we will have completed 1 Peter and 2 Peter, and uh, we're going to go and do uh, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. Amen. We're just going to go ahead and, and continue on in those epistles. So if we're going to look at this subtitle tonight, it would be that the Bible is the final authority. The final authority. How many believe that to be true? Say amen. Amen. So let's look at let's look at the, the scripture as we start. We're going to tear apart this one, this one scripture tonight. It says, indeed, he speaks about these things in all his letters. They contain some things that are hard to understand, things which the uninstructed, unstable, distort to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Very simple verse, but Filled with a lot of powerful things, so we're just going to do one. I could have done maybe three, but then <coughs> you would have said I really talk a long time. So I don't want to have anyone be tired tonight. Hallelujah. So let's look at verse 16. Let's review very quickly uh, what we've been going over the last couple of weeks. We talked about Peter's exhortation and that rests upon the reality that we are in Yeshua, and uh, because we're in Yeshua, we are looking for his coming, right? And because of that, then we should have this anticipation of his return, uh, cause, and that anticipation will cause us to be more diligent to grow in our desire to be like him. And we use the example, if you knew your mom and dad were coming home and you know that you weren't right, you would get yourself right before they came home. Um, if you thought they were going to be gone for a week, you would take your time. But we have to live our lives knowing that he could return when? Any moment, any second. Correct? And because of that, then it's going to help us grow. Uh, we walk in his footsteps as witnesses of his grace and power and shalom. And we talked about that. If anyone is going to have shalom, it should be us. Right? In the midst of everything that we're going through, if anyone's going to have shalom, it should be uh, us in our lives. So Peter reminds us that Paul taught the same thing. Because the apostles are not teaching something different. They're teaching the same thing, and they're actually just teaching the same thing found in Torah. Correct? So we now arrive at verses 16 and 17, though we're only going to do 16. And Peter continues to speak of Paul's epistles. <coughs> and that when he speaks about that, he's telling them to reckon them as Scripture. That what Paul is teaching, as well as Peter is going to be in line with the Torah. Therefore, it can be elevated to the place that, and of course we have it now in our Bibles, canonized, right? Old and New Testament from Genesis to Revelation. So the understanding that you can, they're, they're giving credence to these um, epistles. And he's warning us that the untaught and the unstable will actually distort Paul's words to their own destruction. And the sad thing is, in contemporary Christianity, Christianity has distorted Paul's words by saying that Paul got converted and therefore Paul was not for Torah. And we also have people within the Hebrew uh, uh, <coughs> uh, movement that also doesn't understand Paul. And so we have uh, contemporary Christianity who receives Paul but twists its words. Then we also have some in the Hebrew um, movement who discard Paul because they don't understand what he's talking about. So we have to really <coughs> become taught and stable so that we understand Paul. So he concludes these verses with an exhortation to guard ourselves so that we are not caught up and then also carried away by false teachers and false teaching. And that would be our responsibility. And what is the one way that we can not be pulled away by false teachers and false teachings? <coughs> Study to know the word, right? If you know the word, then someone says something opposite of the word. You say, that's not right. Correct? But if you don't study the word, then everything I say, and everybody, everything everybody says is what? It's <laughs> well, not, it might be suspect, but that to most people, it is, it is okay. They just kind of receive it. And then, 
And then instead of, instead of saying to people, the Bible says, you say, my preacher said. And uh, you're in danger when you start saying the preacher said. Because it needs to be the Bible says. Remember, the Father wants me to do this. The Father is talking about this. So he exhorts us to accept the inspired scriptures as the final authority in all matters of faith. Everyone say that word all. All means in your in your job, in your thinking, in your emotions, in your relationships, in what you do inside this house and outside this house. All matters of faith, <coughs> that word of God needs to be the final authority. And tell us how we live out our faith in Yeshua. It's not just about living out your faith among people who are here. If the time that you live out your faith is when you walk through these doors, you're missing a point. Every area of your life should be controlled and and led by the final authority in your life. If it doesn't say it, don't do it. If he tells you to do it, then do it. Correct. So let's look at second Peter three. We'll start with 15 and 16, even though we're going to only hit 16 because we did 15 last week. And think of our Lord's patience as deliverance, just as our dear brother Shaul also wrote you, following the wisdom God gave him. Indeed, he speaks about these things in all his letters. They contain some things that are hard to understand, things which the uninstructed and unstable distort to their own destructions as they do the other scriptures. So let's tear it apart a little bit. If we look at that scripture, it says, indeed, he speaks about these things in all his letters. <coughs> so. What we, here's what we know. We know that Paul wrote his epistles uh, from 48 to 64 CE. We also know that the probable date of 2 Peter is toward the end of Peter's life, which would be around 68 CE. So then Peter knew of a collection of Paul's epistles that was circulating among the communities or the kahila <coughs> of the way, the followers of Yeshua. Because they would write a book and then they would remember by courier, pass it around, pass it around. So these contemporaries would be reading what each one was saying. And of course, they would also be judged by each other. If somebody was writing something that wasn't true, they'd say, listen, you're writing something that's true because there has to be continuity. There has to be truth among all of them. Correct. And so they are making sure that that word of God is true. So they're not just saying, oh, he wrote a book, but I'm not paying attention. I believe Peter read Paul's writings. I believe that Paul read Peter's writings and every other uh, <coughs> one that is reading or writing. They understand them. So this means that in the decade before the destruction of the temple, which was 70 CE, the followers of Yeshua were already considering the writings of the apostles as bearing authority of Scripture. Which means they saw that there was not a discrepancy between the Torah and those epistles. And because of that, then they recognized the writings of the scriptures, the epistles were bearing the authority of that scripture. <coughs> carrying some divine authority that was equal to that of the Tanakh. What is our foundation? Always the Tanakh, the Torah. But again, because of the inspiration, because of the Ruach HaKadosh, because of the um, walking with Yeshua and then what they were writing was what Yeshua said. We find that those epistles can then arrive at a same level. We also know uh, to give you some little bit of understanding, you know that there are other books that have been found other than these. Correct. And what what the men of old or the <coughs> patriarchs in the beginning, what they did was they had a standard that they would live by and in a, in a sense, uh, I think that they were being led by the Ruach, that they would read certain books and they didn't just say, oh, I'm not going to have this book in here and I'll have this book in here from their own. There had to be a, a standard. And if that book did not follow that standard, then it, it could be a good literature, but it wasn't going to be part of the continuity of that word. So what we have today, even though there are other books that are not in this word, I believe, and you should believe, that this is really what God had in mind as a round understanding of who he is. And in fact, we have 1 Corinthians and we have 2 Corinthians. But there's a, there's a place in the scriptures, I believe, somewhere or <coughs> that says, um, you know, the, the, the letter that he already sent to the Corinthians. I think it's in the 1 Corinthians. So therefore, if you read it in 1 Corinthians, then that means there was a letter prior to 1 Corinthians. So actually, 1 Corinthians is probably 2 Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians is probably 3 Corinthians. 
And whether they have found it or whether it was out there or whether it wasn't something that they, by prayer and looking at the, the meat of it, brought it in. There's other books out there is what I'm saying. We have now uh, this, this holy book that we have. And those epistles were brought in. And if you are instructed and stable, you will find the continuity through Genesis to Revelation. So he says in all of his letters... So we know that Paul wrote a lot of letters speaking in them of these things. What was he speaking about? What's Peter talking about? Second coming. So what he's saying is, is Paul was also talking about the second coming as I am also talking about the second coming. And we have just two examples up here for you to look at and write down. <coughs> First Thessalonians 4, 13 and 14. Paul says, now, brothers, we want you to know the truth about those who have died. Otherwise, you might become sad. The way other people do, do who have not do who have nothing to hope for, for since we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, we also believe that in the same way, God, through Yeshua, will take with them those who have died. So Paul is talking about the second coming. Paul in this writing is actually comforting those that maybe are thinking, all right, my loved ones are dead. Where have they gone? What's going on? We all have moments of of confusion, of uh, Doubt in our lives, right? Uh, sometimes larger, sometimes smaller. And these epistles help us kind of bring us back to uh, our hope. We also have 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 52. Let me say this, brothers. Flesh and blood cannot share in the kingdom of God, nor can something that decays share in what does not decay. Look, I will tell you a secret. Not all of us will die, but we will all be changed. It will take but a moment, the blink of an eye, at the final shofar, for the shofar will sound and the dead will be raised to live forever and we too will be changed. <coughs> Peter saying, Paul speaking about the same thing I'm speaking about. And that is when all else fails, you have a hope. Right. In the midst of a tribulation, guess what? You have a hope. Whether you're living or whether you're dead, it doesn't really matter. The hope is still there. Right. If you're living, hallelujah, live for him. If you're dead, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Hallelujah, amen. The hope is what we're excited about. And so he's reminding them about that hope. So in all his letters, speaking in them <coughs> of these things, it continues on, it says, in which um, they contain some things that are hard to understand. Well, there's one thing that we need to know before I, we understand what hard to understand is, <coughs> is this word created and written to us to be hard to understand? No, because where is it? It's near you, right? In your mouth, in your heart. He's not written it <coughs> so that you will spend all your life not knowing it. He's written it so that you might know it. What normally stops us from knowing it? Ourselves, our lack of study, our lack of instruction, our lack of stability, right? And we kind of lean more on our feelings than we do the word of God. And so this is what makes it hard to understand. Uh, basically, if you just, you know, say this is what it says, what it says, it's really not that hard to understand. It gets hard to understand through our own perspective and through how we're seeing things at that moment. So in which are some things hard to understand? So let's look at that hard to understand. I gave you the Greek word dos, to, uh, <coughs> dos notos, and that is the only time that Peter uses it in all the apostolic scriptures. So if he uses a word that is not written in the Bible, because we define words by finding what they mean in the Bible, correct? What defines the New Testament? The Old Testament. What defines words used in the New Testament? The same word used in the Old Testament. But if you find a word that's not been used, then therefore we have to go to non-biblical Greek, which means we had to go to Greek literature where they used it to understand what they were saying. And so in non-biblical Greek, the word denotes something difficult to understand or to comprehend. OK, <coughs> something difficult to understand or to comprehend. So in our context it may well have the same sense of difficult to understand in light of one's own <coughs> presuppositions. How we view things, how we have been taught, 
you as well as I know that some of the things that we have learned over the last 10, <coughs> 12 years was more difficult to understand because we already had thinking processes that were opposite to what it was. If you would have come in with a clean slate, it would have been no biggie, right? But because you have other things, that's teachings and and <coughs> that have been developed in your life, whether through environment, whether through doctrinal uh, stands, whether it's through your mother and father, whether it's through culture, then in light of what we know, it's difficult to understand. But to just a clean slate, it would not be as difficult. So it would seem that Paul's view of a man-made halakha as not being equal with divine Torah was the issue because what was happening in those days as well as today, we sometimes in our man-made traditions or halakha, which is our way of living, and our way of living comes from a lot of times the way that we've been taught, um, becomes equal with divine Torah and what Paul was saying is this divine scripture overrides everything in your life, even if your way of life <coughs> seems to be OK. If it's not OK with the word of God, then it's not OK. And it doesn't matter if some religiousness or doctrinal stands um, have created a way of life for you, a halakha, um, it is not equal with the divine Torah. You have to look at the divine Torah. The word of God has to be that final authority, not doctrinal stands, not what you believe and how you want to live it. What does the word say? What does the father say? What the father says goes. Correct. So he says then that this is hard to understand <coughs> these things. And it's hard to understand by the uninstructed and unstable. So the uninstructed and unstable, which distort. All right. So let's look at untaught and unstable. Untaught. Uh, we have the Greek word. Again, it's a word that only has been used in the apostolic scripture once. So we have to go to the non-biblical literature. And that denotes to be uneducated, unskilled and ignorant. OK, to be uneducated, <coughs> unskilled and Ignorant. What does the Bible say? Study to show yourself approved. So what is he saying? The untaught. And the unstable. Let's look at unstable real quick. Unstable means unstable souls, which actually means people who are unsure of what they believe can also be known as people who are easily knocked over. And the example is someone who's standing only on one foot. So again, if we look at this scripture, who basically it could mean all of us, but really, who is Peter zoning in on that would be uneducated and unstable? Who? Oh? <coughs> well, Gentiles, yes, for one, because they have no idea what Torah is. They're coming in. They're brand new. Correct. So if anyone's going to be able to to mess them up. It would be someone who can come in and say, well, this is what it says, this is what it says. And if they don't know anything, you just say, oh, OK. So the Gentiles, those who are newly born again, even if you're coming in uh, Hebraically, if you're newly born again, you don't have the experience or the knowledge or the study enough to sometimes <coughs> not catch those things that are incorrect. Correct. And so then that's why he's saying you're untaught. It's not a slam when he says you're uneducated, unskilled and ignorant. It is a it's a place of where you're at sometimes because of where you've come in. Right. And unstable just means that you're unsure of what you believe. And, and uh, most of us have been unsure of what we believe from time to time. And, and it takes time to work those things out to to finally get a stride of understanding those things. And so he's saying that those who are untaught. Those who are unstable, what do they do? Distort. Now, remember the last couple of verses, who was he talking about? False teachers and false teaching. So who is going to be more amped to <coughs> cause the distortion? 
false teachers. And what's the problem with false teachers? They're untaught and they're unstable. Okay? So they are distorting. So let's look at that word distort. Um, they're distorting the scriptures, uh, uh, stray below. And that means to trust, torture, or cause inward pain. It's interesting that a false teacher who does false teachings will cause those who are listening and following them to be tortured and also cause inward pain because they're not going to come to the full knowledge of who Yeshua is. And they can also be led off astray and down a path that they don't want to be going down a path. Correct. So this distortion, this torture, <coughs> uh, this cause of pain, which is why God says the harm that you bring, I'm holding I'm holding it until until the end. And that harm will be paid back to you because it's great harm. Right. It's great harm when you lead someone down the wrong path. Which is why he says we all should not be striving to be teachers. You need to be careful. You don't really want to be a teacher because you are held accountable. You're to a, a higher standard in God because you're leading people either right or wrong. And if you're leading them incorrectly and distorting the scriptures, then you're in trouble. All right. Uh, just an example, because I just heard it this recently. <coughs> the um, Joseph Prince. How many have ever heard of Joseph Prince? A lot of people love him, but he's actually you know, a heretic. But that's neither here nor there. He had went to the uh, uh, Philippi um, Philippines. Yeah, I was going to say Philistines. He went to the Philistines. He went to the Philippines and he was preaching to them <coughs> that you are never to say never to come out of your mouth any sin that you've ever done, because all that sin has been covered. It has been underneath the blood. And if you say it, you're just you're you're going to be living in a, a, a realm and a world where God doesn't want you to live and that you need to not even express any sin, not even let it be utter out of your mouth because you're going to be out of the will of God if you do that, because once it's over and thrown the seal of forgetfulness, it is over. Well, at face value, if you think about that, that don't sound too bad, right? But in reality, what does the word say to us? Confess your faults, correct? And then he says <coughs> he is what faithful and just to forgive us. So what does God want us to do? Confess to recognize what we've done, then bring it to him and confess it, because when you confess it, then it, it comes to light that you shouldn't be doing it. If you always don't come and be throw it under the blanket, then you'll just never have to worry about it. But the, the whole purpose of bringing it before you is to remind you not to do it. So what seems to be very you know, nice or spiritual <coughs> is actually against the word of God. All right. So when someone went there and that was one of the first questions that they asked, are we not allowed to confess our sins? And, and, and this teacher said, well, of course, the word of God tells us to. And they said, well, this guy said we're not supposed to and so on and so forth. Very simple. That distorts the scripture and very simply that will twist and torture and cause inward pain. The, the another part of that is to distort a statement so that a false meaning results. And when you're distorting is to make the biblical text say something the author never intended. Did God ever intend that we, once we come to know him, never, ever utter anything that we've done wrong? No. So we have to be careful. Right. And who does that persuade? The uneducated and unstable because they haven't read the word of God enough. And and then plus we have in this in the United States and though we're supposed to be honoring those who are, you know, our pastors and teachers, we don't elevate them to a place that you can't say, is that right? <coughs> and we've taught our people and I just say we as a preacher to be quiet. I'll tell you what it, s it says, and if you don't get it, then you'll get it one day. You know what I'm saying? Because you don't confront. Right. Because that is uh, disrespectful, but that's not disrespectful to confront. Correct. The how you confront is disrespectful. Right. But you certainly can say, I don't understand that. Can you explain that a little bit more? Let's, let's and we've had those times of, of discussion and you don't see me fainting or, or freezing you out or telling you, to, you know, here's your <coughs> here's your Uber ticket hit, hit the road. Uh, if, if you're preaching the word of God, it should be sometimes a. Uh, uh, back and forth. You want to understand. I want to explain it to you. Correct. 
and we're growing. We don't want the scriptures to be distorted. I don't want to distort them, and I don't want you to receive any distortion that I've given to you. So it's okay. Correct? So we have to be willing to receive. But it doesn't mean, that uh, again, that you have to challenge everything because you should be doing what every day of your life? Studying. <coughs> if you find you have to challenge me in everything, then one or two things is wrong. You're misreading what you're saying, or you're still sitting under someone who shouldn't be teaching. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? And I don't know why you're still here if you're sitting under someone that you have to continue to correct, right? So untaught, unstable, those who distort the scriptures, those who distort Paul's words do the same to the rest of the scripture, that word of God says, right? If you're going to distort Paul, you're going to distort everything, right? It kind of goes on along the line. If you're going to hate your brother, you're going to hate God. You know what I'm saying? It's just one of those things. It, it, you, you, you cannot just pick and choose. So if you're going to say, I think this is wrong, then what you're saying is all the other scriptures. You're going to change all the other scriptures. And I know it's hard for us because, again, we look through our own <coughs> presuppositions, correct? And so it's really hard sometimes to, to rectify those and really hard to change our lives because we've lived in a way um, that we thought was pleasing. And because God didn't kind of, uh, uh, you know, open up the earth and swallow us, we think everything's okay. But it doesn't mean that it's okay. Right? So Peter may be speaking of those who deny Messiah and therefore twist these prophecies of the Tanakh, which clearly predict a suffering Messiah. And we see that in uh, <coughs> Judaism, because in Judaism, the rabbis will not allow their, uh, their kahila to read Isaiah 53. And the Torah portion, that will be skipped over. They're not allowed to read it. Why aren't they allowed to read Isaiah 53? Because it describes the suffering Messiah. And so, it, and, it, and it so matches Yeshua that they say, don't read it. It's not necessary to read it. And if they do read it, and someone says, well, look, they'll say, no, that's Israel. Well, we know it's not Israel, right? We know it, it, it describes Yeshua as a suffering uh, Messiah. So that's how we do it sometimes. And even in <coughs> you know, Christianity, we do the same thing. Well, that's not what it means, so you don't need to worry about it. Well, what about that's that's not what it means. You're not you know, you need to have more understanding so you don't need to worry about it. Well, I want to worry about it if I want to follow the word of God. Right. So those who deny that Yeshua is the Messiah, likewise, deny his deity, then also deny his resurrection, then also deny his promised return. And we can get in a, in a, a very um, bad place. Second Peter, chapter three, 16. <coughs> Indeed, he speaks about these things in all his letters. They contain some things that are hard to understand, things which the uninstructed and unstable distort, and they distort it to what? To their own destruction. To their own destruction. So let's look at that. To their own destruction. Apalia, okay, <coughs> is the Greek word, which is going to be very important to us. All right. So to their own destruction, there's two ways that you're destroyed. Temporal. And eternal. Temporal destruction, if we look at it, is that you are wandering in the sea of unbelief and therefore you forfeit the shalom that settled faith in Yeshua provides. So here you are, you are temporarily being destroyed in that you're not really able to live the fullness of God's joy, the fullness of his peace. And so every day of your life is a wreck. You're being temporarily Temporal destruction, because tomorrow morning when you wake up, you should be the happiest than anyone else. You should have shalom more than anyone else. Right. <coughs> you should be secure more than anyone else. And if all hell is breaking loose, you're the one that should have the shalom. You're the one that should have the stability. You're the one because you have who you have him. But we find in, in us as church folk that a lot of times we are worse off than the world. I'm just saying. We sometimes are uh, ones who don't have the shalom. We're more oppressed, more depressed, more this and more that, which is a sad state because we have allowed, apparently, the lack of understanding in the scripture, <coughs> the distortion that we have received, correct, to cause us destruction temporally. 
There's also an eternal destruction, and that is eternal punishment apart from the blessing of Yehovah. Now, here's where it gets a little tricky. We've talked about it a little bit. <coughs> that Greek word does not go back, does not necessarily mean cease to exist. So when I say eternal destruction, it doesn't mean that you're over. Which is what some people believe, you know, uh, that and whether you're again, you're not in those circles, but you, you might hear it, that there is a lot of preachers that are turning to that. If you don't know Yeshua, if you know Yeshua, you're going to live with him. If you don't know Yeshua, you'll just be burned up and be gone. It's over. There's no punishment because God of love would not cause you to be punished for the rest of your eternity. So it, it means and, they, you know, they can take that. Greek word, <coughs> which can mean cease to exist, but not necessarily because it also means that which is lost or that which is wasted. And let's face it, we've all been created in the image of God, correct? But if we're not going to step up to the plate and receive him as our savior and live this life the way that we're supposed to be living, then we have really wasted our lives. We've lost what it could have been for us, right? Even if we look at our own selves, if we would know then what we know now, we wouldn't have lost so much between the times. Correct? We would have made better decisions. That doesn't mean that we're, you know, oh me, oh my. It just means, wow, if I, if I would have known it, <coughs> maybe I'd be farther along. Maybe, maybe I wouldn't have wasted so many things. Maybe I wouldn't have lost so much time. But we did. Uh, no condemnation. You just pick up and say, well, I won't waste any more. Right? I'm moving forward. So when we look at that, the um, <coughs> the uh, 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 polium or polyme word group does not always suggest cessation of existence. And we have those examples in Luke 15, uh, Matthew 9, 17 and Matthew 26, 8. So if you write down those scriptures, I'll give you the example. In Luke 15, <coughs> the parable given there uh, talks about the sheep that is lost. Right. So if the sheep is lost, which means you can't see him, right? Does it mean he no longer exists? No, it means he's lost. He's still there somewhere, but you don't see him, right? The Luke 15 also talks about the coin that is lost, right? How many's ever lost money and you don't know where you put it and then you know, three weeks later you put on a pair of pants and you put your hand in here and say, oh, there's that money. <coughs> so it wasn't like it was gone. It was just lost, right? The Luke 15 also talks about the son who was lost. So the son is lost, correct? He leaves the father so the father doesn't see him, but because the father doesn't see him doesn't mean that he's gone, no longer exists. He exists, Correct? And when he comes to his senses, he does what? He comes home. So he was lost. He was wasting his life. But now he is found. So this eternal destruction is that you could have just lost and wasted your life. It doesn't mean you cease to exist. It just means that you have lost and wasted what you could have been. In Matthew 9, 17, <coughs> talks about the wine skin that has lost its ability to expand, burst when filled with new wine, and is ruined. That same word as uh, apalia, same word, ruined. So though it bursts, does it burst and disappear? No, it's still there, right? But no good. It's been wasted. It's not able to hold anything anymore. Um, likewise, the ointment poured out upon Yeshua in Matthew 26, 8, the apostle said it was wasted, right? But it didn't mean it no longer existed. It was still there. It's evident on his feet. It's evident wherever it was placed. It's there, but it's not gone, right? So we have to understand that, that you can have temporal destruction, which means you're not living the way that you should live your <coughs> your loving God and doing, but you don't have the shalom that you should have. You don't have the joy that you should have. You don't have any of those things that you should have. And then this eternal destruction, which means that you have wasted and lost uh, a lot of those things in your life that you could have had. All right. And when we stand before God, we want God to say what? 
you know, you're lucky you made it, buddy. <laughs> by, by the, you know, skin, what do they say, skin of your teeth? <coughs> uh, you know, wow. No, well done. I mean, you enjoyed the full measure of what I wanted to give you. Joy, un uh, full of joy and joy unspeakable, right? Full of glory. Uh, the, such joy and shalom. Uh, we want to experience that in our lives. We don't want to lay down and say, oh, I'm, I'm finished. Thank God it's over. We want to we want to fight against dying because we're torn. We're enjoying Yeshua right where we are. Right. <clears throat> I'm enjoying him, waking up with him and going to bed with him and seeing him every day and loving him and experiencing him and <clears throat> seeing him get me out of things and walk me through things. Wow. Uh, that, that's life. Right. When you feel things, that's life. So I'm torn. But I also see him and want to be with him. So I'm torn. But either way, to be absent, to be present, there's really not a big difference other than the absence of what I'm going through. Because he's still with us. So. Second Peter chapter three sixteen is really focusing on the Bible that is our final authority. And we have that <coughs> Greek saying. And that Greek saying basically says that the Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and halakha. The way that you walk halakha, the way that you walk your life. This is your final authority. You know, it's almost like we should carry this Bible around when someone asks us to do something, hear something, be something, say something. We say, hold on, I don't know if I can say that. I don't know if I can be that. I don't know if I can do that. Let me look. Sorry, I can't do it. Oh, I'm good to go with this one. <clears throat> if we had that type of understanding of the scripture, again, we can't carry it around, but we certainly can hide it in our, in our heart. And we might not be able to memorize all of it, but we certainly can have an understanding of what it means and that we know then that uh, how we respond, we respond according to that scripture, right? And uh, so we really need to have this word as our final authority, and it makes it simple. And I've said this before. The father said yes, the father said no. Well, what do you want? It doesn't matter what I want. The father said yes, and the father said no. Out uh, of the question, well, do you think it's wrong? It doesn't matter if I think it's wrong. Honestly, it doesn't matter. I can have a lot of feelings. Right. Depending on the day. Some days I can say I'm OK and some days I can say, no, that ain't right. <clears throat> so I just got to rely on the father because the father is constant and 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 is, you know, stable. So I don't have to even take it. You know, sometimes we're afraid to say no to someone because we don't want them to feel a certain way about us. But you can alleviate all that by just saying the father said. The father said, and we said that before, you know, if someone comes and as a teenager and says, I want you to go here and you know it's not right. You just say, well, let me ask my parents. And you already know what your parents are going to say, which is one of the reasons why you're asking your parents. And you come back and <coughs> so you save face instead of saying, I don't want to do it. You just say, mom and dad said no. And they say, oh, you're mom and dad. And you're like, yeah, I know mom and dad. But actually inside you're like, thank God. <laughs> and then if your mom and dad said, yeah, you can go. You're like, what are you, are you crazy? You want me to go? Do you know what happens over there? Because you don't really go and go, but you want to be able to go out and say, my father and mother will not allow me to go. So you can kind of release yourself from people, <clears throat> from them making you feel bad. The father said, I can't. So, you know, I wish I could. But the father said, I can't. So you just fall back on him. He, the Bible is our final authority, which makes us then we have to what? Study. <clears throat> Many sources are valuable. You can have a lot of sources in your library, a lot of commentaries. They're valuable. A lot of books that people have written are very, very valuable. I mean, I read some books that probably people that, you know, I probably say you shouldn't read. And I have read them and, and found, you know, a sentence or something. And I, I use that and, and preach from it. <coughs> I, I'm not going with the same vein or idea that they have. But there was an idea that popped and, and I was able to use it. Um, again, you have to be a little bit more mature to do that because a lot of times we get sucked into the belief system. You have to be able not to be sucked into the belief system, correct? So there are many sources that are valuable, but the Bible is, say it with me, the final measure of what is Jehovah's will. Therefore, all other literature must be judged against the inspired word of Jehovah. As good as that book is, you take it and you measure it against the word of God. And if it's not measurable 
and does not speak the same way, then that book becomes a doorstop. Right? Especially if you can't glean from it. You have to know whether you can glean from it. Right? And not all of us can glean from it right away. The more mature you get, the more you might be able to glean from it. It won't bother you. You're not sending a child into in some place where they can be devoured, where you could maybe go in and not be devoured. <coughs> Correct? Yes. Which is why we have to train a child, because a child, even though we don't sometimes have that <laughs> maturity level, they don't have the same maturity. They can't be put in the same position that you can be put in, and then you're mad at them because they couldn't say no. Okay, they're, they're 13, they're 16, they're not going to be able to say no. But I've trained you and taught you. Yes, but they're 13, 16. Listen, as godly as they can be as young people, they still have feelings. And they, and they still have to work some of those out. And you are their protector, right? And you have to make sure you're protecting them to, to when they finally get to a level. And sometimes we're very <coughs> confused because we think they're more mature than they are, Right? But you have to look at your own self. If I, even my own self, can fall underneath this and, and yield to sin, what do you think a 13, 16-year-old is? What do you think those young people are going to? You can't, you can't do it. Not because, oh, you don't trust them. It's not about that I don't trust them. It's a matter of a level of maturity. It's not, you don't trust me. Okay, okay. If, if that's how you want to view it, then I don't trust you. Do you know why? Because <clears throat> I'll tell you why. You're made from the same seed of your father and your mother. We know who we are. We can't trust you. <laughs> we just can't trust you. You know why? Because we've been there. And we know the decisions that we make and have made. So we have to make sure that word of God is that final measure. Now, is rabbinic literature uh, authoritative? Uh, again, if I was in a, a contemporary Christian <coughs> church, uh, we wouldn't even think about it because they don't even look at it. But because we are people who want to kind of reattach ourselves to our uh, Jewish root or Hebrew uh, who break understanding, we kind of bring sometimes those rabbis into our lives. Are they authoritative? <coughs> well, uh, the Mishnah has six volumes, just to give you an idea. And uh, they say that it was created uh, between uh, 135 and 217 CE. And it was uh, this guy, Yehuda uh, Hanasi was the first to compile the Mishnah. However, it didn't have its final edit until 7th or 8th century. We also know that there are two different types of Mishnah, which just means if I wrote uh, one, so it's the Myers Mishnah, and then there's the Raglan Mishnah. We also know that in the Jewish community, the two Mishnahs, which are both supposed to be from Moses, do not line up with each other. So either Moses had a split personality or <coughs> through time, man has added and changed and so on and so forth. But this word, you can find a, a scroll or a fragment in, in a jar in a cave and you'll match it to what we have today. And guess what you will find? It is exactly the same, <coughs> but you won't find that with the Mishnah. OK, so that means this is the final authority. That means rabbinical literature or any other literature is not authoritative. It can be read for commentary. It can be read for um, culture. It can be read for ideas, but it's not the final authority. And when that kind of overrides, and that's what happens in the Jewish community sometimes, is that their Mishnah kind of runs equal to the Torah, and that's where they get in trouble. Correct? <coughs> Again, if the Mishnah, I just want you to understand this. If the Mishnah says that you are to wear 20 hats to be spiritual, if you choose to wear 20 hats, it's no skin off my nose. I'm not going to be upset with you. Wear 20 hats. I don't care. But if you wear 20 hats, now demands that everyone wear 20 hats to be born again, that's where the problem comes in. Correct? If you want to wear 20 hats, wear 20 hats. It doesn't matter to me. If that makes you feel closer to God, then okay. <coughs> but it's not a criteria because, again, <coughs> tradition, as long as it doesn't become a tradition of man which overrides the word of God and makes the word of God null and void, we all have traditions. 
right? Some of you get up, roll out of the bed, brush your teeth, then take a shower. Some of you roll out of bed, take a shower, then brush your teeth. Some of you roll out of bed and decide, I don't think I'm going to do either of them right now. And so whatever, it's your tradition, correct? No one's telling you you have to do one thing and then another and then another and another. So it's not going to, you know, we have someone at Line of Judah, um, two who came, and I, I've known them before, and they can be, <coughs> they come from time to time, but not often, and, you know, can be a little troublemakers, but it's okay, we can handle them. But, you know, I wasn't there, and so Sister Tanya was directing, and of course it was Sabbath, so they light the candles, and of course they had to tell her, you know, that's pagan to light the candles, because you don't find it in the scripture. And the thing is, people don't get it. It's not pagan unless you worshipped it. It's called tradition. Does the, does the Bible tell you to light two candles on the Sabbath? No. The Bible talks about honoring the Sabbath and having a holy convocation. Why do we light two candles? Just to remind us to what? To remember it <coughs> and to keep it, right? Light it, not light it, not a big thing. Uh, my Sabbath doesn't fall apart if we don't light a candle, right? But your Sabbath should not explode because you see someone lighting the candle. Oh, I can't look at you. You're lighting a candle. And so, oh, my, I'm melting, I'm melting, I'm melting. It doesn't make sense to me. Listen, if I want to light a candle and you don't like lighting the candle, then my advice to you is to close your eyes while I light the candles. <laughs> and unless I'm asking you to rush up here and light a candle, you're not really participating in the lighting of the candle. <coughs> but don't name it pagan. It's a tradition. Can we do without it? Yes. Is it a matter of salvation? Certainly not. Correct? It's just something that we choose to do. It's a tradition. We do it. We find it, you know, as a commandment, how to do it. In the, uh, we don't even probably follow the right commandments of how to do it. We just light it. It's a very nice tradition. It, it reminds you of something, but it, it doesn't become a commandment, right, where that if I came to your house on uh, <coughs> before Sabbath on Friday and you didn't have a candle lit, I'd be like, this whole household's gone to hell. <laughs> when we had the, the Jewish couple that came to us, you know, we, we light our candles uh, on Friday night at 6. It, sometimes it, now it's dark, but sometimes it's not dark. We do it <coughs> for the simple reason it's a tradition, and we also do it at 6 whether the sun is going down or not because Kyle has to go home, but he gets up at 3 o'clock in the morning, right? So if it doesn't get dark to 8, that really throws him into a, a spin. So we just do 6 to 6, 6 to 6, 6 to 6, 6 to 6, because somewhere it's dark somewhere. When we had the Jewish couple, though they were very respectful when we did it, they really didn't participate too much. Um, he had to go out and make sure that the sun was down and he saw the moon. Then he came in and did it with his wife. Did we get all upset and say, now, get out? We already did it. You don't have to do it again. You think you're more spiritual? No. <coughs> we honored them. We let, uh, it was fine. Do you know what I'm saying? No big gig. No one's passing out. No one's, uh, there wasn't, you know, you know fighting going on. <coughs> They watched us do it. We did it. W they did it. They went out and looked. Okay, here he comes, and they did it. It's okay, right? Because what's the, po what's the commandment about? Sabbath, right? The traditions. So the Mishnah uh, today is elevated where sh it should not be elevated, okay? And the Mishnah has gone through decades of redactment. It's, it's been edited. It's been uh, added. It's been changed. Uh, and why those changes, no one knows, but the word of God has never been changed. Uh, doctrine has been changed in, you know, people's denominations. We have meetings. Do we do this? Do we do this? Do we change this? <coughs> Catholic Church has many changes. Um, uh, the Baptists have many changes. Uh, the assemblies have many changes. Sometimes they allow things and they don't allow things. Sometimes they receive, you know, you just don't. So you don't, there's only one that has never changed. That's the word. So is it wrong and even naive to read the Mishnah as though it has authority that goes back to the first century Jewish communities? <coughs> it's just a product of people's thoughts and perspectives. It has no authority in your life. Okay, it has no biblical or divine authority. 
That's what we even have to be careful, you know, when I was telling you about the man at the um, Brothers Pizza, and he was like, you know, about going to church, and we said, well, we went to church yesterday. Oh, you went to church yesterday, and of course, he then didn't think that we were saved, but he, he said, well, you know, you, <coughs> you go to church on Sunday, and I was like, why are you interrupting my pizza? So then I had to share with him, no, not really, the scripture says, and he was like, well, it says it, I said, where does the scripture say it? He said, somewhere in Matthew and John. I said, can you tell me where it says in Matthew and John? No, not off the top of my head. So then I share with him some scriptures, and Gail said I kept poking him in the belly, which I didn't mean to poke him in the belly, but I kept, po you need to go study, you need to go study, you need to go study. I'm thinking the Lord was trying to tell me to him, in the innermost part of your being is living water, find it. But what he was basically saying was, he didn't know the scripture, but he knew tradition. And he was following tradition. He was standing for his tradition. I get that. Stand for your tradition. <coughs> but here's the thing. Know the scripture. Right? Because tradition has no biblical or divine authority. Tradition cannot change anything, cannot shift anything, cannot move anything, cannot discard anything, cannot add anything. And when it starts doing that, then that's when it becomes wrong and sinful, right? So let's look at this summary and application real quick, <coughs> and I'll let you go, because I don't want to be s called a long-winded preacher. <laughs> Peter warns us not to follow those who are unwilling to submit to scriptural authority. Again, if you're following someone who's unwilling to submit to scriptural authority, don't follow them, Right? He characterizes these people as unlearned and unstable. <clears throat> they don't know enough to know that the word of God is the absolute authority. And they still think that they are the authority. So what he's telling us, if, if he's saying these people are unlearned and unstable, he wants us to know that we are not to despise learning. This is one of the very powerful things about a Wednesday night. It's a learning. It's, you know, the tour I give to you, it's, it's what you have an uh, ability tonight to, to take notes, to raise your hand, to try to figure it out, to <coughs> and we try to tear down those scriptures. You know, when we do whole books like the book of Matthew or the book of First and Second Peter, or, uh, I mean, to me, that's great because you're learning something, right? You're learning something very powerful. Uh, <coughs> we need good education. I know we carry on a lot and say, you know, people just got out of cemetery, meaning seminary, but we, we do need good teaching. Right. And we need to study to show ourselves approved. Right. And what Peter is saying to us is that they twist the scriptures to make them say what they want them to say. But in doing so, they bring upon themselves some great destruction. And I don't want to live this life and bring my own destruction. There's enough things out there trying to destroy me already. I don't need to be my own person who destroys my own self. Right. So the application then of Peter's inspired words is very clear. These two things <clears throat> make the words of Scripture the standard for our lives of faith and obedience. What does the father say? What does the father say? Even if you want to say W.W. Uh, what is it? W.W. J.D. Yeah. What was that back here? Oh, okay. What would you? Say? Yeah, I'm just. Yeah, we would change it to why. I was just like, he's back here. Why? Why? I don't know why. I don't know what's wrong. Why? Why? What? <laughs> I don't know what you're saying. Why? Why? <coughs> Make the words of Scripture the standard for our lives of faith and obedience. And number two, judge all teaching and instruction against the unchanging truth of Scripture. And what does not match, say it with me, do not accept. Do not accept. If if it matches, receive it. If it doesn't match, reject it. You don't have to storm out. You just say, oh, okay, well, I'm going to reject it. Right? But here's what we do know. These scriptures, and I'll let you go. Psalms 119.89 says what? Your word continues what? Forever, Adonai, <coughs> firmly fixed in heaven. Your word is already settled in heaven. These are scriptures that you can use for people that say, well, this has changed and that doesn't belong to it. No, you, the scripture already tells us it's, it's firmly fixed. Right? It's not changing anything. 
Look at uh, Matthew 24, 35. It says the same thing. <clears throat> Heaven and earth will pass away, but what? But my words will never pass away. Why can his words ever pass away? Because he is the word. If his words pass away, he passes away. And he's living forever. And he changeth not. So you went from Psalms, which everyone believes in Psalms. Right? <clears throat> and if you believe in Matthew, but if you're some people who believe that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John um, is going away with once Acts came, well, then we have 2 Timothy for you. And 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Do all you can to present yourself to God as someone worthy of his approval, as a worker with no need to be ashamed, because he deals what? Straightforwardly with the word of truth. The word of the truth. So we have to judge the teachings accordingly and make sure that what we're hearing is according to that final authority in our life. It can sound good. And it can be very pleasing to our flesh. Right? But just because it's pleasing to your flesh doesn't mean it's right. How many hopefully have learned that lesson over your life? Right? Not everything that seems to be fun <coughs> and pleasing because sometimes sin is fun and pleasing. But don't make it right. And if your criteria is that it's fun and pleasing, you are, <laughs> well, we're going to have a good old time. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? We're wide open then because everything can be fun and pleasing. It is what is pleasing to him. Amen? All right, any questions? Amen. Father, in the name of Yeshua, we thank you and praise you for this night. Let the word of God permeate, penetrate our hearts and our spirits. Father, let us go forth knowing that your word is a final authority and live by it in all matters of faith and be obedient to you in all ways, allowing your word to be the standard that we live by. And we'll give you praise in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand before Yehovah. Next week, we'll finish up Second Peter with two big verses. You're an awesome God you reign From heaven above with wisdom, power, and love Yahweh Way You're an awesome God Yahweh You're an awesome God you reign From heaven above with wisdom, power, and love Yahweh You're an awesome God